Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for a Facebook Live conversation about human trafficking. According to research commissioned by the Women's Foundation of Minnesota and conducted by the University of Minnesota, there is a correlation between large-scale events and sex trafficking. However, researchers note that it overshadows the fact that women, men, and children are sexually exploited 365 days a year in communities large and small. Mayo Clinic and The Link, a Minneapolis-based nonprofit, have teamed up to announce the launch of RiseUpGifts.org as part of an effort to raise awareness about sex trafficking and inspire people to make a difference by helping victims who have been trafficked. Joining me today for this conversation is Dr. Arne Graf, child abuse expert and medical director of the Mayo Clinic Child and Family Advocacy Center. Dr. Graf, thanks so much for joining me today. Good morning. So let's start the conversation by talking about what is sex trafficking? Can you give us a definition of that, please? So sex trafficking is when someone is used for sexual purposes, exploited in that way for the monetary gain. Someone's getting money, not the person who is involved in sexual act, and it's against their will. In the opening, I mentioned this happens in communities large and small. And I know from being here in Rochester that there's a lot of people in this town that don't think that it's an issue. but. Is it really small towns, big cities? It's all over the country. It really is. People have an expectation that it's large metropolitan areas, but the people who do the exploiting have realized that smaller communities are just as much a target. We average an estimate about five girls, that's under 18, a night in Minnesota. So that, again, that's small town also. What are other misconceptions that people might have about sex trafficking or someone who is being trafficked? I think the biggest misconception is that people who are being trafficked are making lots of money, that they choose to be in this relationship, when in fact they are held, uh, they're stripped of all their identity, they can't escape from this situation, and they're basically held as a captive, and, and they experience a tremendous amount of medical and mental health effects because of it. But everybody thinks that they're making all this money and they choose to be there. Choosing to be there, definitely one that I have heard. Another one that I have heard, and it's maybe not a question, but it's someone just saying, I just don't understand why they don't leave. Mm. What, if, if there is a child that is at the mall, you know, a teenager that is walking around the shopping center, you know, um, they obviously are free and on their own, they could just leave, but it's not that simple. It's not. Um, it's the, the kids and the adults live in a very dangerous environment. The, the offenders typically have something to use against them, photographs, stories, uh, threats to their family, so they would be, they would, someone would be harmed if they left. So they're very frightened to talk to somebody or to walk away from someone. They, they live in a very dangerous environment. Even though you don't see someone, someone is still watching them. Let's talk about a couple of common scenarios, um, how someone ends up being um, in that industry, being uh, like, say, for a teenager or a child, how do they end up in the sex traffic industry? Well, first, you have to understand that people who do the exploiting are incredibly good at this. They know how to target the kids. So uh, some populations, particularly runaways, people who are having drug dependency or, or on social media where they obviously are telling everyone no one understands them, the LGBTQ community tends to be really targeted for some reason. So that population of people the exploiters reach out, they become their best friend. In some metro areas, if you're a runaway, within 24 hours, you've been identified and approached for a room and board and friendship. So if you're a runaway, then homelessness must mm -hmm. be a big part of it as yes. well. Yes, yeah, big concern. Uh, what about an adult then? How does an adult end up being part of, uh, unfortunately, sex trafficked? I would tell you, I think it's the same population of people. You know, we have, even in Rochester, we have a significant number of people who are homeless. And so being able to target those folks and offer them drugs if they're chemically dependent, or money or new jewelry or, or gifts of that kind, sounds very enticing up front. And then once they've got them in, either chemical dependency, they loop them in, or the threats, then they can't leave. And what about people from other countries that come here? Yeah, you know, it's clearly a problem for uh, immigrants coming in who may be at risk for deporting or something of that nature. The statistics still show, though, that um, people in the United States 
uh, is one of the it's one of the largest groups of people that are being exploited and not necessarily um, just people who are here um, and don't have the proper carding. Well, let's talk about um, the healthcare provider aspect of it. Obviously, Mayo Clinic is part of uh, making, trying to make a difference in this. Um, what puts someone at, uh, how does a healthcare provider fit into this puzzle? Well, what we're trying to do is, first of all, make people aware that it exists. If we do that, then I think people recognize in the community people who may be at risk. What we want to do is we want to put the offenders and the buyers of the sex trade out of business. We can stop that. We'd be, we'd be helping. The other part is uh, recognizing these victims because they are incredibly high risk for medical problems so that we can offer them the services. And that's a challenge because of what we just talked about, about the, the fear of admitting that they need help or they're part of this. I should also say, if you have a question that you want uh, me to ask, go ahead and post that now, and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, what do care providers look for? You know, the the doctors or the nurses in the emergency department, I would imagine, are the f front line of this, but maybe I'm wrong. No, it's, it, it's a starting point because a lot of these victims uh, come in for multiple medical problems, uh, abortions with infections, uh, community infections that are excessive, sexual transmitted infections. So in the ER, um, if we suspect, we try and develop a way to talk to them, try to get a way to get them alone from whoever's with them. Uh, but it's real difficult because of the fear. But we watch for unexplained infections that don't make sense in a certain age group. Um, excessive jewelry and a lot of expensive gifts in someone who's very young who doesn't seem to have the money to buy. Um, people who seem very depressed or they're with someone who's very controlling, kind of like a domestic violence type environment. Well, let's talk about the domestic violence part because some, we did get a question someone asking if there is a connection between domestic violence and sex trafficking. I don't think there's, I don't think that the majority of the domestic violence situations are sex trafficking. Certainly the reverse is true. People who are being trafficked, the domestic violence situation they live in is, is pretty prominent. There are situations where families literally traffic their own children or members in their family, so it does happen. We just got a question too. Is there a connection between um, the internet and human trafficking? Is this found often on the internet? It, you can go on the internet now and buy uh, anything you want when it comes to sexual exploitation. And so it clearly has made a difference because of the anonymous of nature of it. At least people think they're being anonymous when they purchase. And so they can literally go on the internet, purchase the age, sex, gender, race of someone they want get them to fly into a community, and then send them out. What is uh, a question that popped up as I was getting ready for this, the difference between um, human trafficking and sex tourism? Uh, I, obvious, is it just that you're traveling somewhere? Right. Sex tourism is just part of the sexual exploitation, just like pornography can be part of it or the online type mm -hmm. sexual stuff. So sex tourism, again, it is present in the United States. Many people think of um, countries abroad where many Americans go because they feel they can get away with sex with the younger generation. And is it easy to extricate someone from it? I mean, if, they're, if they end up in the emergency department or if they are arrested, um, if there's a net that catches them the first time, is it easy for them to get out of this industry? No, it's very difficult. And, and um, part of it is, again, the, the loss of everything they've had. You take them out if they're drug dependent or the lifestyle that they had, even though they hated it, it's the only thing that they have. And so it's not uncommon for us to lose people back into the system. And if runaways, obviously you had mentioned that earlier, if there's runaways that are involved, they don't want to go back to where that they were. They often don't, but again, that's part of, it really takes a whole team to come together for these victims. It's not just a doctor, it's the mental health, law enforcement, housing, education, everybody to help address all those issues so that we can say to them, look, we have something we can offer to help you make that, that first step, because otherwise they're overwhelmed. Let's talk a little bit about the link and about riseupgifts.org. We do have a question from the audience. Is there a hotline or a number to call if you suspect someone is being trafficked? I think we can probably lump all that in together. Yeah, so there are, there are national hotlines. There are organizations within the state. 
uh, and there are organizations in the country like Polaris, which is a, a national organization that you can go on to. So, um, and if you Google it, you can usually find one of them that's out there. Um, the link and, and Mayo coming together, the idea, of course, is we just want to make everyone available, uh, aware of, of the situation. And then the second thing is, how do we help the victims? So the Rise Up campaign to get something available like clothing, toothbrushes, um, things of that nature that gives them a start. It's a huge thing for these individuals, for these victims. And again, that is riseupgifts.org. Yes. Which you can find more information. Uh, I was, we were talking before we got started here, just this weekend, um, someone that I know on Facebook said, I saw somebody out at the mall here in Rochester, a teenager that was out in the parking lot. And um, she said, I, I just didn't have a very good feeling about it. And I thought, my, if I was in her shoes, my first inclination would be to ask that teenager, are you okay? Mm -hmm. What's going on? Um, the teenager told her that she was there selling things for their church group. But what do you say to someone if you, you know, a teenage girl is just stere almost stereotypical to the point right. that maybe we should talk about other instances. But what do you say to someone if you uh, suspect this might be going on or you're concerned about someone? You know, I think what you do is just what you said. You, you just say, look, what can I do to help you? Do you need help? Are you, are you afraid or in danger at this point? Keeping in mind that um, when it is truly someone who's trafficked, even though you don't see someone, many times these kids and young adults are being monitored by someone. So they're very afraid to do a lot of um, discussion with people. Right. But, but offering opens the door, and that's the key. Hmm. And then what do you do? If you, the answer that they give you is something that is obviously, like you just said, I'm being watched and I can't say anything about this right now. Would, there, um, would you call the police and just say, there's a, there's a teenager out here? I mean, you know, are we at the point where that teenager isn't going to get into legal trouble then if the police come mm -hmm. and can help them? It's, that's kind of faced a turnaround as well, right? It has. Minnesota, among other states, has made the decision that teenagers, if you're under 18, and, and actually, again, when they're older, um, you're not going to be charged for prostitution. You're not going to be charged for those crimes. If you commit other crimes, right. they'll have to figure out how to deal with it. But the idea is they're victims. They're, they're not the promoters of the crime. Uh, we have another question. Um, it's a good one. Why did Mayo Clinic decide to become involved in this? Well, Mayo Clinic has always been involved in uh, abuse-type situations, whether it's adult domestic violence or kids and trafficking is part of that so we've been a part of that for 40 plus years it's just now there's an opportunity again because there's a big event in Minneapolis to get a lot of public awareness a lot of media and it's our opportunity to to again Minnesota wide and nationwide say we're aware of it we want to do something about it and if you need help we're here you had also said before we got started that you know major cities or big events uh, I think maybe people say, oh, yeah, I'm sure that that's something that's going on. But you were at a small community in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, tell that story and how that's surprised you. Yeah, so most airports now have, <clears throat> have billboards on trafficking, but I was in a small, small community, gas station, and one of the video games, when it wasn't being used, had an ad about trafficking on it, <clears throat> which, again, is an ad getting to anybody that walks by there can see this. So again, it's it's these momentary repeat things to remind us about it because we all live in, in relatively very nice homes and environments and we just don't think about it if it's not kind of in our face. How long have you been working with this problem? Or I just know you here in the city of Rochester is an expert who can talk about this. Um, how long is this something that you've been interested in trying to prevent? Well, I, I think any of us in primary care, whether family medicine or um, pediatrics, it's part of your practice. Um, it's just that it's become more national news in the past 10 to 15 years. People are being much more aware of it. So it, I think it's always been part of our work. Part of the riseupgifts.org, that's riseupgifts.org, is sponsoring an online gift registry. Mm -hmm. And um, someone is asking, what is happening with these gifts? How are they getting to the people who need them? Well, part of that's going to be through the Link uh, organization in the Twin Cities. They deal with youth and families. Um, they deal with a lot of poverty. 
And so the actual mechanics of that is going to be probably operated through them where people have been identified. Uh, some of my favorite people here in Rochester, and anyone who is not in Rochester right now, uh, if you ever come to visit, you'll see Assisi Heights up on the hill. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what the sisters at Assisi Heights are doing um, to help with this problem. Uh, the sisters of St. Francis have just uh, taken this on full bore. It, it's been impressive and incredible. For years. For years. <laughs> yeah, it's um, amazing. And they put on conferences every year. And they've made it their commitment again that this is an oppressed group of people and they need to be attacking it and dealing with it and offering services. And, and I would tell you, I, I'm so impressed with what they've done, offering education, um, sponsoring programs. So they've, they've just really taken this to heart. I think the biggest um, thing that is confusing for people or a problem for people to understand is just the fact that this is actually happening. Whether it is someone saying, well, this is something that happens in the big cities, or this is something that would happen with those little small town runaways, or mm -hmm. over the years, I know that the county attorney here in Rochester, in Olmsted County, has been quite um, effective in helping to get the word out about this as well. But I just would like to talk a little bit more about uh, this really is a legitimate problem, and it's a problem everywhere. It, it really is. I mean, it's a it's a population of people that, again, have nowhere to turn to, or at least out of fear don't. And uh, again, the number of cases that are seen throughout Minnesota, whether large or small communities, it is not something brand new. It's just we're simply recognizing it and we're admitting that it exists, uh, which is a big starting point. But it, it's present every day in our world here. Um, certainly, you can go to a large metro area and walk the streets on Friday, Saturday night, but I would tell you that the internet is probably doing much more business and mm -hmm. uh, just because it's secretive and it's quiet. Um, but the county attorney here has done some great things working on operations to try and catch those people, the buyers, because if we can get the buyers, then you can start to eliminate the demand, which is the key. One of the things that you said right when we got started was about uh, the misconception that someone is choosing to be part of human trafficking or the sex industry. And I think that's where prostitution, mm -hmm. uh, that part of this comes in, because forever I have heard the argument that, well, these are women who are choosing to be prostitutes. Are we changing the language a little bit here, or is there a differentiation? That's a good question. I, I, think, um, I think there's a differentiation sometimes, but I would tell you my experience in dealing with women who are um, and men who are involved in these programs where they are prostituting, the majority of them have got other things that have kind of pushed them to this, whether it be previous abuse that they've experienced as a child or domestic violence in the home, things like that. So I think the majority of the time, there's usually either coercion or some force to get them in there, or there's some other problem that that person's experienced. And what, what might that be? Well, for, for some people, again, it's having grown up in an environment where it was domestic violence, they may have been the victims of sexual abuse when they were younger, and it's just part of their life. It was a continued problem. They may have significant mental health problems that puts them at risk for being exploited, severe depression, it's not being treated, post-traumatic stress disorder, targeted, mm -hmm. um, just like the homeless. Target, they have a need. I need place to stay, I need food, um, or I need drugs. And if that's the case, we can offer help on this. We can make you feel better. I think I have specifically been saying female pronouns, she and women, but um, men must be part of this, young men. You mentioned yes. LGBTQ. Yep. Um, are, how much are men victims of sex trafficking? You know, we don't know exact numbers. Gl nationally and globally, women by far are the majority, and of, of those, uh, better than 55% of people trafficked, whether it's labor or sexual, um, are kids. So, and how many are men? We don't know because, again, people are afraid to come forward because of the stigma that goes with that, unfortunately, because then it doesn't allow us to help them treat for infections and the mental health needs. Uh, I know the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, uh, I follow them on social media, mm -hmm. and they seem to be doing a good job of teaming up. I mean, they certainly talk about missing children, but they're also kind of teaming up with this sex trafficking and human trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, are you, is there an, 
is there a web that is starting to come together that certainly technology is helping, but is that, do you see that being formed over the last few years? I think clearly there is a, a national type of uh, uh, pull together on internet so that there's resources for both medical providers and non-medical people and community. So I, I think organizations uh, find out who's involved. Like you said, the sisters, mm -hmm. you have Mission 21 in town, you have a number of other organizations in town that are very much committed to this. And originally, no one kind of knew who else was doing stuff. And now people are aware. So if we don't have the resource, we know where to send you. Mission 21, uh, interesting, it was the first um, in the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. to offer shelter for people that had been caught, usually in the legal. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. it the, the police would find someone who was being trafficked, and mm -hmm. then they didn't have anywhere to go. Right. And Mission 21 was providing, or is still providing, shelter for those people specifically as they're coming out of sex trafficking. Yeah, Mission 21 and some of the other organizations have just um, really taken on trying to help the victim get to a safe place, um, have a chance to just kind of decompress from everything that's mm -hmm. going on, and then really identify all that's going on. Like I said, it's it's not just a mental health or drug, it's infections, it's lack of education, family, getting ties back to their family. Who's gonna help you bridge that gap? I can see if that's, you know, if someone's a runaway, but um, recently we, we just had a woman who was here from China. Her visa was being held Away. She didn't have access to her paperwork, her passport, her visa. Yeah. How do you help those people? Well, again, that's part of the whole team process. So mm -hmm. the Rochester area is one of the seven big sites in the state where multidisciplinary teams can come together for the victim. Everybody has access to different things, whether it's legal or visa status, things of that nature, to be able to offer mm -hmm. something to help the victim. All right. If... Uh, we might have reached people today that have never even considered this as a Good. situation for their home or something for them to be out when they're Christmas shopping, uh, doing holiday shopping. Mm -hmm. um, what, again, do we want people to look for? I you know I saw, uh, my friend saw this teenager out at the mall that came up to them trying to sell something. But if you are out and about um, over the next few weeks and months, what should you be looking for? You know, that's part of the problem. It's not, it's not always obvious. Mm -hmm. I think what you do is you're just aware that it exists. And when you see someone who clearly seems to be a panhandling in a in nature of, of your concern about their safety, just ask them about their safety. And you can find more information again at riseupgifts.org. That's riseupgifts.org. Yes. Any other um, resources that you want to highlight? No, I think, again, Mayo Clinic and, and the other hospitals in the state have got good organizations like our Child Abuse Center that, again, are a resource. People can always call and ask questions. We're happy to feel that. Um, that'd be it, though. Very good. Well, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. It was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. That's all that we have time for today. Thank you for joining us for our discussion about the launch of RiseUpGifts.org. This discussion will be on Mayo Clinic's YouTube channel for future viewing. If you didn't get a chance to answer your questions, we will try to do so after the broadcast, so please feel free to post those. Thank you, have a great week and a great day.